hands. Because our, our call to worship is from Psalm 47. It says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, just, we come before you today, Lord, because we are a needy people. Lord, we know that we are lost without you. We ask, Lord, that you would meet with us here today. We came here to meet with the living God of the universe, the King of all things, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Lord, we just ask that you would be here today with us. Instruct us, Lord, in your word. Help us to take it deep into our minds and our hearts and our souls. Help us, Lord, to learn more of you and to become more like you. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Just inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, take control of this service. Have your way with it. Let everything be done here today. Bring you honor and glory and praise, Lord. We thank you for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
victorious. Amen. All praise and glory to our God, our Father. Amen. My, my guitar is off, isn't it? My guitar off? Okay. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'll check it out and see. We're going to change the battery of my guitar real fast. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Redeeming Grace. It's great to see everyone. It's great to have you all joining us on the live stream as well. Go ahead and take your seats. Oh, wait, you already did? That's all right. You don't have to wait for me to tell you. It's just I have to remember to tell you because I've been at a church where they didn't sit down until I told them to. Um, when I was teaching in Juarez once, they stood standing. And they're like, after like 10 minutes, they're like, tell them to sit down. <laughs> so I always try to remember to say that now just in case. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements that I want to go over um, for you this morning. Um, first and foremost, today after service, we have tryouts for our Christmas play that we're going to be doing. And so all kids of all ages, doesn't matter how old of a kid you are, if you would like to participate in the play in any way, um, please stay afterwards. Um, we got tryouts and everything for that. Um, if you can help us out, there's all sorts of needs that go into that. There's um, stage help, there's um, sound, audio, all those different things and no experience necessary. We're not, you know, it doesn't matter what's on your resume. You can add this and make it the start of your experience. So that'll be after service, and so we invite you for that. Um, we do have a regretful announcement. We are canceling our Harvest Festival for this year um, for a couple of reasons, the main one being the city has outlawed the, the whole trick-or-treating thing, and We've already had, you know, COVID teams visiting us here, and so we're just not looking to get anybody else. I, if it was just me doing it, I would totally put it on and get in trouble. I'm okay with that, but when I have other volunteers, I don't want them to have to deal with that also. So we're going to postpone the um, Harvest Festival. We are still taking donations for candy and stuff because we are going to give our kids candy bags in the children's ministry, and they are still going to be uh, blessed in that way because I think the church is sweeter than the world. But we do want to let you guys know that in, in November, November 15th, after service, we're going to have our church giving. That's our uh, church Thanksgiving potluck right after service. And so we'll have a sign-up sheet um, hopefully by next week. I didn't get one ready this week, just a lot of craziness going on. I was watching my kids all weekend. My wife was at a women's conference just being blessed and having some fun with some of the women here. And so I forgot to do something because... Apparently, when you're watching all the kids, life is crazy. <laughs> so we'll have a sign-up sheet for that. And so there will be uh, all sorts of different options, side dishes, desserts, um, you know, the, the, what do they call those, the, the cutlery, the paper plates and things, and then also uh, for any of the main dishes, ham, turkeys, things like that. So I'm all for a Thanksgiving brisket. Well, all right, we'll see. we'll see how we can do that. <laughs> Last but not least, I did just want to remind everybody, we have these um, lists available at the front of the church. These are our um, hospitality items uh, that we go through quite frequently here at the church. And uh, if you have been wondering how you can help out the church in any way, what you can bring, like maybe you go to the store and you're like, man, I wish I knew what to buy for the church. We have a handy-dandy list right here of all of our main used items. Right now, we do have a major use for... Three-ounce cups. Um, the kids use the three-ounce cups for drinks from for water and stuff, and so we're running low on those ones. But if the Lord leads you in that way, we appreciate your donations. We appreciate your support. And that being said, that's our special announcement, standard announcement, is that brown wooden box is our agape box. That's for your tithes and offerings, prayer requests, and praise reports. You can do all those things online at our website as well. And that's all I have for the announcements. I think there's something else going on, so I can't tell you to stand up and say hi to one another or to get refreshments or anything yet. So, Day is October 11th, which is Pastor Appreciation Day. 
So Mike, Jim, I'm gonna turn your faces bright red. So I was asked to put this presentation together to show our appreciation for them. Six years ago, Pastor Mike moved from Calvary Chapel, Sun City. He planted it at a school that was used for quite some time until a new principal said we could not meet there. That did not stop him, however. He leased this building that was once a gym. This proved that the church is not just a building, it is the people, which was taught in one of his recent messages. We worked on the building and made gradual changes to the building until it is the building we have today. We're still making changes. Pastor Mike has been preaching here for the whole time this church has been established. I've known him for literally as long as I can remember. He's a great pastor. But when he is not able to preach like that time he preached in Sun City, Pastor Jim, he steps up to the plate and delivers a great message. He's been here almost as long as this church has been established. He also opens the services with calls to worship, which is a great idea because it gets the congregation in the focus to worship. He plays the keyboard for the worship team as well. He's a great pastor and worship leader. And Pastor James, he has been the worship pastor for, well, again, as long as I can remember, maybe five years. He's currently in Kuwait serving our military. He's the lead singer for the worship team when he is here to worship. These three men, they give their time and dedication to the church, and they should be appreciated for all they do. Today is the perfect day. Please give them a huge round of applause for all they do. And I have some cards to give out to them. Pastor Mike. Please come up here. Pastor Jim. And Pastor James isn't here. Thank you. Go. Over here, over here. We're gonna shine. As you can see, the kids are up here. I don't know if anybody noticed that. But the kids would also like to show their appreciation to our pastors. Um, they're gonna they're gonna do a a, a song for you guys, and uh, they also have a, a little gift for the pastors as well. Uh, in Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 6, it says, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So just in the same way that the Lord encouraged and promised Joshua as he led his people, I believe that the Lord also encourages and reminds uh, our pastors that he is with them wherever they go. So without further ado, here are the kids, and they're going to give uh, a nice uh, encouragement to our pastors.
Unison. Unison. Unison cord pack. Unison MIDI cord pack. It is super, super useful. I was actually kind of blown away when I first opened it. This has over 1,200 MIDI files that can help you make chord progressions. It's essentially a chord pack with loads and loads and loads of chords. Every chord is organized by triads. Okay, I think I'm, am I muted still on the, in my headphones? Check, check, testing. Can you guys hear? Yeah, there I am. All right. At this time, you guys can go ahead and stand up and say hi to one another. Um, we have coffee and snacks and goodies out there, and um, you guys can go ahead and get a, a drink and grab a snack and then uh, make your way back in here as soon as you hear the worship team starting to play again. You guys can bring your snacks in here. That's awesome. Uh, those kids are awesome.
what we came here today for, Lord. We want to see you. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want to get your word. We want to know what you think about things. We want to know what your heart is for this world, Lord, because we want to know how we can best serve you. Lord, there's a lot of things going on in this world, a lot of scary things. There's the COVID and there's other things happening, people losing jobs. And we got this election coming up and nobody knows what's going to happen with that. And there's just all kinds of things happening, Lord. But we don't trust in any of that because our faith, our hope, our trust is only in you. And Lord, we know that you have your hand upon the entire world, that nothing happens here that you don't know about. Everything is according to your plan. So Lord, we don't have to worry. We make the best of what we have, Lord, when we trust in you. And we just go on our way because our, our job here is to lift you up that people would be drawn to you to bring your message to this dark and dying world, Lord. That we just, that's what we want to do. Forget what's happening in the world. Be aware of it, Lord, but don't let it control us. Don't let it take over us. Help us, Lord, to be controlled only by you, by your grace, by your love, by your power, and help us to stand in that. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. He drew straws, and I got the short ones. No, that's not. <laughs> that's not it. I, is the, I'm the administrative pastor here. What that means is I do a lot of the. Can I do that? Okay. We do a lot. I do a lot of the uh, bookkeeping. Matter of fact, I do the bookkeeping. I do the payroll. I do all that stuff. So it was brought to my attention. Actually, uh, you know, we've been seeing it happening here, and I want to show you some stuff. Um, that the budget for the church is not good. Is our budget's good, but. Our income is not good. Our giving is not good. And I want to show you some things here. First, I want to mention, and this is one of the reasons why Pastor Mike is not doing it, is because yeah, I, work, I, work, I work a real job. <laughs> 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 but no. Pastor Mike has given himself full time to the ministry of this church, and he does a great job. I, I'm proud to serve under him. And, and the thing is, though, that he's relying on the church to meet his obligations. And he's just like the rest of us. He has obligations, house payment, car payments, that kind of thing. And so we've been falling short the last several months, and Mike has relied on his savings. And that's running out. So I, you know, told him I would, I would come here and stand before you and show you, show you what's going on. So I want to show you... I don't know how to see that, but I guess that looks better on that, huh? The blue is um, what our giving is by month. Since June, July, August, September, and the first couple weeks here in, in October, and the orange is what we've spent. And then the gray, that's our budget. So that's where our budget is. So you can see the blue was over the budget for June, but since then, the blue, the giving, has been way below our budget and even below our expenses in a couple cases. And it's just, not, it's just not making it. It's just we're not meeting our budget. And um, I want to show you exactly how much we're not meeting the budget. As you can see there, the red numbers are negative numbers. So June, we were actually over budget a little bit. But then in July, August, September, October, so far, we're way behind on the budget. We're way short of what our budget is. And if... I can show you the next one here. It's, um, this is what our budget is. This is what it entails. This is what's in our budget. Is uh, the cell phones for Pastor Mike, 
I play Master, Pastor Mike, Luana, and Donna, right? Yeah, okay. And, and the church phone, that's right. Okay, so we have four phones on there for 200 bucks. Um, the church admin, which is my wife, and um, I want you to know right now that I haven't, we haven't cut a check for Donna for at least a month. And I believe Pastor Mike said he has seven or eight checks that he has not cashed. That we've written the checks, but there's just not funds to cash them. So it's, it's been a while. And like I said, since I have a, a, you know, a regular job, we, we've been able to make it without Donna's money. So, I mean, we're doing okay. The copier um, fees, these are, these are fees for um, the Clover Give and other giving fees, because every time you, when you donate through a credit card or something like that, they charge a fee on that at, at our, on, on, on the Internet. The gas bill, which is you know, heating for this, which is only $60 a month. This is the last four months. Yeah, you know it's going to go up. Um, internet, we you know, sixty-five dollars a month for our internet connection, which then allows us to have all the Wi-Fi and stuff here and, and stream everything online and all that. Um, miscellaneous, forty-three dollars. There was money that left. And I just threw it in miscellaneous because it's basically um, going to Walmart, buying water, uh, not buying water. We don't buy water. Anymore. Oh, but buying little water, little bottles of water, that kind of stuff. Um, Things like that. Pandora, which is the music we use to listen to during the thing, which is five dollars a month. Pastor's salary. Uh, Planning center, which is our app we use to keep everybody connected. And then uh, reach and relieve. We're still supporting them, and that's we believe that's a valuable resource to the community. Our rent, and that's rent and utilities, is about eighteen hundred dollars a month, depending on how much electricity we use during the. You know, summer, it's, you know, electricity goes up because we have the AC unit. It tends to drop off a little bit with the heat because the heat doesn't use as much electricity. It's more gas, but it goes up either way. So, um, water, this is our, the five gallon jugs of water out there. That's what that's for. We, the, the, we pay water bill here for water we use in the church, but that's part of the rent. And then our website is $50 a month to keep the website going. That's, that's our, our budget is $7,100 a month, and the board, we, we are looking into this to see where we can cut. But the, we've come to the point now, and this is the crux of the matter here for you all to take under advisement and consideration, is that Mike is considering having to take a job outside of the church. And um, that's, that's where we're at. And that's it's plain and simple we're at there. I'm not trying to pressure anybody or give you scare tactics or any of that stuff, because I'm sure Mike is not going to be slack in presenting the Word of God just because he's working outside of the home, okay? It's just, it's going to be another pressure on him, and Robert's not here, but you know, Alex, Robert, myself, we may have to step up and take over some of the preaching duties, especially on Thursday night, you know, that kind of thing, because if Mike takes a job, it's going to entail after hours work and stuff like that, who knows what, you know, you're on call kind of thing. But anyway, I just want to bring that to your attention that, that if, they, if, if we don't cut the expenses and we don't get an increase in giving, that Mike's not going to be able to make his bills in November. And he's going to have to take a, a job outside of this. And that, all I'm saying is that that may be what God is calling him to. We don't know. But I want you guys to at least be praying about what, what he would have Mike do what he would have the rest of us do, okay? So I just, we thought, we talked about it, and Mike said, I'm just going to go get a job, and then we decided, no, that's not fair, that, you know, we should bring it to the church, bring it to the congregation, let people know what's going on, to at least enlist your assistance in praying for this thing, because, you know, in the multitude of counselors, right, there's wisdom, and that's, that's what we're looking for. So um, I got to do the dirty job. <laughs> But no, I, I just, you know, I, I love Mike. With, you know, he's, he's like a brother to me. Younger brother, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> and Luana's my sister from another mister, right? I mean, you know, it's like, it, we're a family here. We really are. And we, and we try to take care of our own. We really do. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you for your time, and now we'll get on with the real part of this, huh?
All right. I had the uh, microphone clip popped off while I was sitting down, and so I had equipment failure. All right, if you guys would go ahead and take out your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, verse 49 to 59. And I know that there's been a lot presented to you guys. Um, you get to see the history of the church. You get to see the finances of the church. But I did want to say one thing on a, on a happy note. Um, today is also another special day for me um, because 12 years ago, uh, Luana and I got married. So. And she's the best thing to happen to me since Jesus. <laughs> so if you guys would go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Now that all the, the happy stuff is out of the way, we have a very hard passage before us this morning. It's, a, it's one of those passages that usually you, you won't hear um, taught the way that it needs to be taught because it's not, it's not a feel-good message. And so let's ask the Lord to really open up our hearts so that we can hear what he has for us today. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, as we go to your word, we pray that you would speak to us, Father, clearly. Um, Lord, that your spirit would convict us powerfully. And Father, that you would continue to separate us unto yourself as a people, holy, separated for your pleasure, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got a full 45 minutes, and I'm going to... May the Lord keep us within that, and if he doesn't, um, lunch will be a little bit later. It's okay. So stepping away from um, physical cross-fitness, but we're still going to focus on spiritual cross-fitness. As I said, we come to a very heavy but most important passage in Luke concerning Jesus and his first coming. We have to pay attention to the scriptures before us and the word that God wants to speak to us. We may have wrong ideas about Jesus, his mission, and his call for those who would be CrossFit. These ideas and beliefs are born out of an unbalanced view of who Jesus is as fully God. And these are statements where you hear people say, well, Jesus would do this, or Jesus would do that, and you can't find a scripture to support that, but it just, it sounds like something Jesus would do, but it may not be scriptural. These ideas and beliefs as I said, are born out of an unbalanced view because, you know, we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We know, you know, the things that he's done, the grace and the mercy that he shows, but sometimes we might take it a little too far and say, well, well Jesus loves everybody. And that we, we take it to that, to that extreme, that means that, like, there's no choice that you have to make. There's no separation that he's going to do. And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, my background comes from working in the IT field, and that's why Jim was saying I might have to look for employment elsewhere and it's going to be full-time because they don't do part-time IT stuff because they want somebody on, on call 24-7 um, that can fix their issues because, you know, IT stuff never breaks when it's convenient. It's always at the most inconvenient time, especially here with our technology here at the church. You know, um, we have issues with the live stream going up and down and you, you think it should work and, and whatnot, but with my experience in the IT field, what you come to realize is you, when you set up your WAN, which is your wide area network, which is how you connect from place to place, city to city, outside your building, from one building to the next, um, think of your internet. There's a spot that clearly marks the separation of responsibility. You run into this with your home internet provider. For those of you who have a um, provider um, supplied router, you know that they'll support that router. For those of you that went and got your own router and said, I already have this one and I want to use this one, when you call them up and say, I'm having problems, they go, well, I don't know what to tell you. This signal's getting into your house. You're on your own. Because that, there's a point that marks where the responsibility starts and stops. And that point that marks that separation is called the demarcation point. And all ISP responsibility stops there and begins there, it's a clear line of separation. Luke brings us to a similar line of separation, but here, Christ and his cross 
is the demarcation point. Christ is a separating line and you're either on one side or the other. There's a clear separation. The line of separation, those who would follow Jesus and those who won't. Those who would recognize the times and those who don't. Those who would reconcile with God before judgment and those who won't. Now, Christ's first coming coming brought many things, including the hope and the forgiveness that that we remember him for, but it also brought with him consequences. The line of separation is what you do with Christ, and he calls us to do several things in order to be clear about what side of the separation we're on. You see, we're going to see this morning that he calls us to divide, he calls us to discern, and he calls us to decide. So if you guys would start in uh, chapter 12, verse 49 of Luke's gospel. Jesus said, I came to bring fire on earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two. Two against three, they'll be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see the cloud rising in the west, right away you say, a storm is coming. And so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hands you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. And so Jesus, in the line of separation, he calls us to divide. He calls us to divide. In the first couple of verses that we're going to look at, these are the verses where where people have a hard time seeing this as Jesus. Jesus said, I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze, but I have a baptism to undergo, and it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on the earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. And he explains that division. He says, from now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. See, Jesus proclaims that he came to bring fire on the earth. When you ask somebody, hey, why did Jesus come to the earth? I can guarantee you nobody says, well, he came to bring fire. They'll say he came to die for the sins of the world. They came to, to be God with us, Emmanuel. That's in his name. But remember, the context that we're dealing with right now is in the context of Peter's question that we looked at last week from before, um, where Jesus is proclaiming that they need to be ready for when he comes again. They need to be dressed and prepared, alert and at constant ready. They need to be doing their work and avoiding negligence. And now he says, I came to bring fire, literally to cast out and throw fire on the earth. Now the subject of fire brings to mind two different things that fire is always represented in the scripture. Judgment and purification. Jesus' mission is a devouring fire that consumes and purifies. And you can see that when you think of the context of the cross being a dividing line. Those who accept the sacrifice on the cross are purified. Those who reject will be consumed. Fire in Scripture, as I said, is used to symbolize um, three things usually. Judgment, Holy Spirit, and purification or holiness. The fire itself, as judgment, it's a separation. 
Jesus said, I came to bring fire. I came to bring judgment and separation, a distinction of righteousness and unrighteousness. Do you know that fire has a power to do two things at the same exact time? Fire does two things. Fire destroys the worthless while refining the durable. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the prophet says, See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, and the launderer's bleach. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver And when they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And then that next chapter, the prophet says, For look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. You see the same fire that it's talking about, one purifies and one destroys. And we have a, we, we, we've been brought in the New Testament to understand these fires. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the Bema Seat of Christ. Every believer will stand before Christ at the Bema Seat where your works that you've done in Christ will be judged based upon the motivation. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 13, each one's work will become obvious for the day will, be, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he's built survives, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You see, when you accept Christ, it's, it, it's not about what you do. It's about you believing in Christ. You can still be saved. You can get into heaven singed because everything else that you did was with the wrong motivation. Jesus is teaching, I came to bring a fire. In Luke 3.16, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming, and I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus is bringing this fire, this fire that will separate by the, the heat. It will consume that which is worthless. It will refine that which is durable. And then Jesus says, how I wish it were already ablaze. Like this. Ablaze means kindled. A kindling is a small fire used to start a larger, more sustaining fire. You can't just start burning the logs right away. I've tried that before. It really doesn't work. You have to have a small kindling first. Jesus is wishing for it to have been started. That means that right now when he's talking to his disciples, it hasn't started yet. Jesus longs for the purifying, the separating fire to begin and to grow stronger. And the fire and judgment that Jesus wishes here represents the full kingdom of God. Where Jesus will rule on the throne as king. He says, I can't wait till the day when everything's separated and only the pure remains. But you say, how can Jesus say that? He hasn't even gone to the cross yet. Didn't he come to the cross to die for the sins of the world? Well, just because he longs for it to be set ablaze doesn't mean that he doesn't also long for salvation. Second Peter 3, nine it says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, he longs for that day, but he's willing to endure the wickedness of man so that as many men as possible will find salvation through his name. Enduring the presence of sin, long suffering for it. And then Jesus says, I long for that day. I look for that day. I came to bring fire. But what does he say? He says, but first, I have a baptism to undergo. You see, he longs for that day, that, that separation, that judgment, that line of separation. He says, but first, I have a baptism to undergo. And baptism is a picture of death. Baptism has always symbolized death. It represents an identification with death. And Jesus is saying, before this separating fire can come, I must die. 
And it's not a sprinkling. It's not like he almost died. It's not like he swooned. Baptism, the word for it, is fully immersed, completely submerged. And Jesus is not looking at a partial death or a partial taking on a sin, but he took on full death, full separation from God, paying the price for the full amount of sin. And Jesus said as he looks forward to the cross, it consumes him. It seizes him. His every thought, his every motivation is driven towards that. He says, until it is finished. It's Jesus' sole mission. We've already seen previously in Luke, we've been in the last journey of Jesus to Jerusalem for a while now, and this is the last time. He's going to go to Jerusalem for the last time, and that is when he's going to be on the cross. But he's set his face towards Jerusalem. He's already set his determination towards that. And the mission of the cross directs Jesus' every move. It consumes him. Not because he's apprehensive, not because he's worried. It consumes him because he's looking to the other side when it's accomplished. He's looking to when it is finished, knowing the joy that will come from it. Hebrews 12.2 tells us about the joy of our Savior. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that lay before him, your salvation was his joy. He endured it. And he says, until it is finished, that word it is finished is the same word that he spoke from the cross, to tell us die. One of the last seven statements of Jesus from the cross, in 19, uh, John 19.30, when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. There's so much contained in that one word in the Greek, to tell us die. It's finished. It doesn't mean it's finished like it's finally done. What it means is it means paid in full. Not one cent left owed. Pay attention to that because the last verse that we're going to look at today says you will not get out of there until the last cent is paid. As much joy as there is in Jesus declaring it to be finished at the cross, the cross is the separating line. It brings both joy and consequence. And that's why Jesus says next, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Be honest with yourself in your heart. Like when you hear that Jesus said, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Yeah, because we remember the Christmas songs, peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. We remember that he was called wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. So what does he mean? Jesus is saying that his first coming is going to be the most divisive event ever to happen since the fall of man. You see, at the fall of man, there was the separation between God and man. That's the biggest separation there ever was. But Jesus had the next biggest one. He split the calendar between B.C. and A.D. That's how important he was. He split the testaments of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is Jesus contradicting the prophecy spoken of him? When Jesus says that I did not come to bring peace, he says I did not come to bring health, wealth, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Not on earth. This is what Jesus promised on earth. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, understand it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. So why would there be peace on earth if the world's going to hate you? Jesus is not telling us to make peace with the world. He's not saying compromise and make sure that you fit in with the world. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I came to bring division, to divide and to separate. And his death on the cross will separate. And it separates today also. The cross says Jesus paid it all. And Jesus' death plus nothing else equals salvation. There are some churches that will teach you, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you also have to have the sacraments. But you also have to have confession. They'll say, but you also have to do good works. Jesus is the division. He says, my death plus nothing else. 
And he calls us to follow him as disciples. He calls us as we follow him to separate and divide. Unless one is willing to separate and divide, they cannot be his disciple. This is exactly what he says, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Is he saying we have to go out and hate everybody? No. This is an um, exaggeration. It's an idiom in the Hebrew um, culture. And it's the comparison of the amount of love compared to hate. And it's those who you love the most should seem like hate compared to the love that you have for Jesus as his disciple. And Jesus realizes that when you love him, when you follow him, that it will divide and separate, especially families. I don't think there's a single person in this room represented that has not experienced the separation from choosing to follow Jesus Christ within your family. Are you willing to continue to divide and be on the right side of the line of separation that Christ marks? You see, loyalty to Christ must matter more than peace, and that'll bring division. Loyalty to Christ matters so much more than going out and being like everyone else in this woke society. You see, they'll, they'll tell you that the cross, oh, that's just an easy band-aid fix, and, and we need real solutions. I'm sorry, the cross is the only solution. They think that the problem is something to do with, oh, we don't have enough systems, oh, we don't have enough policies. No, the problem is sin. And the only one who took care of that was Jesus Christ at the cross. We cannot have peace at any cost. And so what Christ is saying right now, the line of separation, we have to divide and you have to make that choice. What peace is worth the cost of Christ's salvation to you. I know people that have lost relationship with their mothers, with fathers, brothers and sisters, even within their children. What peace is worth the cost of following Christ to you? That's what you have to decide right now. In John 17, verse 16 and 17, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's praying this prayer um, right before he goes to the cross. He says he's praying for his disciples, and he's praying for all those who would be in the church. And he's not just saying in that time. He's praying for the church down the line. He's praying for us. We're here right now. He says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means to make holy. It's a picture of a purifying fire. To sanctify is to set apart, separate, and divide. By the word of God's truth, we divide. But Jesus also says to make sure that you're on the right side of the line of separation, you also have to discern. We have to discern. He says to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west... Right away, you say a storm's coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky and the earth, but you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? What he's saying here, he's saying, you can determine the coming time by the signs that you see. We do this all the time. It's easy to determine when a storm is coming. In Israel, if you see a cloud forming in the west, that's a sign. By that cloud being seen, it doesn't even matter how small. In, in, in Kings, Elijah was told to go down and look for the cloud, and he said, I see the smallest cloud ever. And he says, go get everybody ready. It's going to pour. And it does. The storm comes. Likewise, when you feel the wind blowing to the south, you know it's going to be a hot day. And the, day, the hot day comes. Jesus calls them hypocrites, and here's why. Because a hypocrite is one who acts opposite of how they are, or they pretend to be what they are not. Jesus is saying, by interpreting the weather from such small signs, you show yourself to be insightful and wise and aware, but failing to see the signs of the time, 
shows you to be dull and ignorant. Because the hypocrisy comes because when they see such little evidence for the weather, they prepare accordingly. But Jesus has provided ample signs of his Messiahship and his being sent by God and his being empowered to forgive sins. And they request more. And they ignore what they've even seen then. And they continue to call him Beelzebub. They call him Satan. When we want to discern, we have to understand proper discernment requires being willing to judge based on the provided evidence. Not more evidence that we want to see, not specific evidence that we want to see, but the evidence given is what we have to work on. That is what we are called to do. That's what we're called to discern. Jesus is saying that they willfully choose to ignore what they've seen so far, and therefore they do not understand the signs. They willfully remain ignorant of the spiritual time before them. I mean, consider the evidence that they had for knowing the spiritual times. Prophecies from Daniel. Daniel prophesied the exact day when Messiah would present himself in Jerusalem. When Jesus enters into Jerusalem on the donkey, Daniel had it down to the day. They should have at least known the year that they were in. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. That's what he's saying. Seventy weeks for all of that to happen, for the, for the beginning of sin to the end of sin to the setting up of uh, Christ's kingdom. Daniel 9, 25 says, Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, the ruler will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. So seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now when it talks about a week, it's a week of years. It's a week of years. And the way that they measured everything is Sabbath years. That's exactly what they're counting is Sabbath years. And it takes seven years to get to a Sabbath year. So you have 69 weeks of seven years. So 69 times seven is, that's right, 483. <laughs> and if you take 483 years and each year is 360 days, according to the lunar calendar, King Artaxerxes issued the decree to rebuild the temple on March 14th, 445 BC, when he gave Nehemiah permission to go and rebuild Jerusalem. They should have known Messiah was coming 483 years after that. They should have known A.D. 32, Messiah would be there. He would be in their midst. On top of that, you remember King Herod when Jesus was born? He was visited by three wise men who said, hey, we came to find the king who we want to worship. Where is he? And King Herod goes, what? I'm the king. What are you talking about? They said, no, 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 there's a greater king than you. And he was just born. We see the sign in the sky. You know how they knew that? Because of the prophecies of Daniel. They knew to look for their Messiah. But you think that these Jews would have remembered that about 30 years ago, King Herod ordered them, ordered that all male children, two and younger, would be murdered. They should have known. The Messiah's in the midst. Jesus came from a scandal birth as Joseph was not his father. And Mary said, it's a virgin birth. It was prophesied there would be a virgin birth. They should have known. They should have put all this. Daniel said, King Herod did. And this man, his mom claims it was a virgin birth. They should have said, it lines up. And here's, here's the important part. You can't trust religious leaders to discern for you. You can't trust anyone else to discern for you. Jesus says everyone is responsible to discern for themselves. The religious leaders for sure should have known the times. All the signs were there. But instead of acting and understanding with them and preparing accordingly, they ignored them. And they called on the people to also ignore them. This is where the line of separation is. We're all responsible to discern for ourselves. Do we follow our favorite religious leaders? Or do we follow the word of God? 
Jesus says in verse 57 before us this morning, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? To discern is to judge. To discern is to discern what is right. It's, it's what the Pharisees and the religious leaders saying correct about the times, or is Jesus, what he's saying about the times correct? Who are you going to listen to? Everyone is responsible for themselves in knowing and discerning the spiritual times and the signs. Now, Jesus was speaking to a crowd in our passage in Luke, pointing towards his first coming. You see, the first advent of Jesus, did you know that it wasn't at his birth? It was when he presented himself in Jerusalem, the last week of his life, where they came in, where they praised him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And by the end of the week, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. That was his first advent, when he presented himself as Messiah. But I believe that this morning it's applicable to us today because we need to be spirit, spiritually discerning of the times in our day. There's many signs pointing to Jesus' soon return. Giving us urgency, I hope, as we discern the spiritual times that we're living in. I mean, look, Look at prophecy being uh, unfolded right before us. 1948, Israel becomes a state again. A nation. The only people in all the world to ever be fully and completely conquered over and over again and always comes back and becomes a nation again. The stage is set to have a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem in order for the prophesied abomination and desolation. They have everything ready. They have all the tools made. They have all the clothes made. They are waiting for that peace agreement so that they can rebuild the temple and resume sacrifices. We see everything in place and everybody pushing for a one world order. Everybody wants to go global. Everybody wants to be under one rule and one giant global organization, one money, one religion. The Bible prophecies, it's going that way. Technology is present already to issue the mark of the beast where you cannot buy or sell or eat without having it. And on top of all that, the condition of the hearts of men is right. We see it with COVID, the way that we treat one another because of COVID. The way BLM is running rampant. Antifa. We have governments that set up hotlines for people to snitch on one another about what they see or don't see. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. As we see more and more lawlessness across our nation, they're calling for the defunding of police. I can't think of anything more lawless. And then Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, but know this, hard times will come in the last days. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We see it. We see the government. They're doing it ever so slightly, but I don't know if you guys know this, but there are specific laws about what businesses can or cannot be open, and they're specifically targeting churches in several states. And it's even gotten worse. In fact, up in New York, the mayor of New York is saying, I'm going to make synagogues closed. Notice they've never made any single statement about mosques. It's only been towards the Christian church, and now it's towards the Jews. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Are you discerning the times properly and preparing accordingly? We may be seeing Jesus sooner than we thought, and that's wonderful. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And that brings us to what Jesus is saying. We all have to decide. We all have to decide. Verse 58, Jesus says, as you're going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you'll never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. 
Jesus gives us an illustration right here to bring everything together. A concise parable to show. This is what you have to do when you choose to follow Jesus and your discerning of the times. He's saying the Messiah is here and he's offering you a chance to settle your accounts. Why would you go to court when you can settle your account before you get there? Who, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just who wants to go to court, right? I mean, the, we all try to get out of jury duty if we can. But who wants to go to court? Who wants to go and, and have somebody take them to court to settle an account when you can do it outside of court? That's what Jesus is saying here. And he gives four characters to illustrate. There, there's the person who has the debt. There's the adversary who's taking him to court. There's the ruler who's going to make the decision and the bailiff who's going to throw him in jail. Jesus is saying, settle the account before you get to jail, before you get to court. Because Jesus is giving the sense, when you owe, the case isn't going to go well for you. If you wait until you get to the court, it's not going to go well for you. The person is them. The adversary is Satan, the accuser. The ruler is God, and the courtroom is the great white throne room of God. No one who makes it to the great white throne room of God will have a favorable judgment before God in his courtroom. And I can say that with all confidence because those who are in Christ Jesus don't go to that courtroom. But you won't have a favorable time if you make it in that courtroom. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen under condemnation. Everyone is infected by sin. And everyone must pay the penalty for sin. Everyone will be guilty before God. Jesus is saying, why, why get to that point? Settle your account before you get there. Settle the account before court. Then all is well. Jesus is saying, all the way up until you get to court, you can reconcile the account. You're like, well, how much time do I have? Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for people to die once, and after this, the judgment. You have your whole life. How long is that, though? Who knows their expiration date? Who knows the date that God is going to say, you know what? Your time's up. But you have all the way until your time is up, so why? Why would you put it off? Why would you walk all the way to court when you can settle now? That's what Jesus is saying. Why would you go that distance? Why would you, why would you risk it? The line of separation is to decide now whether or not you're going to settle your account or you're going to go to the courtroom and try and settle it before God. He says, knowing the sign of the time, the coming of Jesus is upon you, what are you going to do with the cross? That's the demarcation point. That's the point of responsibility. Christ did everything he was responsible for. And all he's calling us to do is what we're responsible for, and that's believing in him, trusting in him for the forgiveness of our sins, admitting that we are a sinner in need of a savior. But he gives us a promise. If you wait too long and you find yourself in that courtroom, it's too late. Judgment will be passed. The bailiff will jail you until every last cent is paid. But remember, Jesus is the one who paid it in full. If you accept him and his forgiveness, it's paid in full. If you don't, you must pay every last cent. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Reconcile, that means settle your account. Settle your account with God through Christ Jesus. And he continues on, he says, working together with him, we also appeal to you. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. At an acceptable time, I listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. And Paul says, see, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. For all who are listening, all who are here today, all who are listening, now is the day of salvation. This is the only time that you have guaranteed that you can give your life to Christ that you can find forgiveness for your sins, that you can get on the right side of that line of separation. The separating line is Jesus' death on the cross. And by it, Jesus divides everything from the calendar to eternity. 
We must make sure we do not find ourselves on the wrong side of the line of separation just because we don't like the idea that Jesus is divisive. Just because we think that Jesus came to make everything all work together and, and bring everyone together. He didn't come to bring together the believer and the unbeliever. He came to divide the believer from the unbeliever. Our Savior clearly taught that if we proclaim and hold to the true gospel, we must be prepared for division, even in our families. J.C. Ryle pointed out, it's not the gospel which is to blame for such divisions, but the corrupt heart of man. But we must stand with our Lord even when it results in such painful division. And Charles Spurgeon, he was accused of being divisive because he pulled out of the Baptist Union, which was tolerating liberals who denied fundamental biblical truth. That doesn't happen today. He countered, he says, where there can be no real spiritual communion, there should be no pretense of fellowship. Fellowship with known and vital error is participation in sin. We have a line of separation from those who discern the times differently from we, than we do and from those who decide differently than we do. We see the signs of the times. We know that we need salvation. We've chosen to settle our account before we get to that courtroom. And because of that, we're divided. We will have a line of separation from anything that would divide us from Christ or the holiness that he wants us to have. We need to be okay with that. We need to say Christ above everything. All else is considered rubbish, as Paul says. Refuse, trash, dung. Mark 10, 29, Jesus promises you this, though. When you make that choice, when you divide, this is what he promises you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake or for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. There's nothing that you are sacrificing that he will not repay a hundredfold. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, as we come to your passage, may we remember that you are divisive. Not because you're trying to stir up conflict, but because you're trying to drive sinners to find a savior, to find forgiveness for their sin, because you want relationship with us. Lord, we have a debt that we could not pay. Jesus paid the debt that he did not owe. so that we could be with you. Lord, I pray first and foremost that you would help us solidify in our minds that we choose you over everything else because we have decided we will be on the right line of separation. We will be on the right side of the cross. We will be in the forgiveness that you offer us. And then, Father, I pray that you would inflame our hearts with that fire and passion to share your gospel that doesn't say peace above all else, but says Christ above all else. Because sin is wretched and horrible. The only way that sin was defeated was through the death of the most beautiful, innocent, holy God. There can be no peace made where there is sin. There must be a separation. Father, help us to choose. And then, Lord, I pray for those who, who may be hearing and, and, and they realize they're on the wrong side of that line of separation. Father God, I pray that your spirit would be pulling and, and talking and, and preaching to their heart right now, Father God, that you would turn hearts to you, that you would bring people to realize their need of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, the only name given under heaven by which men must be saved because he's the only one who paid it. And he is the one who is the divider. So, Father, we put all things in your hands. We ask now that you would deal with hearts. And I'm going to say as, as the worship team sings this last song, if that's you here and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, 
or maybe you have and you've chosen that you didn't want to divide as much as he's calling you to, but you realize that you need to. Don't leave here without dealing with that with God. We have people that will be available up here, myself included, who will pray with you, who will lead you through any questions that you have in that. The only thing I ask is, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to make that choice. Don't leave here without making that choice. It gets harder and harder the more you put it off. Thank you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you're thinking that uh, you don't know what I've done, that God can't forgive you, this song says it all. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's a light in the darkness.
never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. sight. We walk by faith, right? So, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. He's faithful even when we're not. He keeps faith with himself because he can't do anything else but that. That's what he is. That's his innate nature. It's the way he's made, the way he was. He wasn't made, but it's the way he is. He's always been that way. We're faithless people. We say we're going to do something and we do something else. We can't keep on the same track. We, things we want to do, we don't do. The things we don't want to do, that's what we end up doing. That's what Paul said. He said that that's what happens. We're people. We're human. We have sin within us. But he made a way where there seemed no way so that we could be the children of God when we were destined for hell. That's where we were heading. That's what we deserved. But he sent Jesus to die for us, to become our righteousness. Because we became his righteousness, and he took our sin on. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin. He took the sins of the world on himself. And Lord, all we can do is thank you for it, Lord. And we don't have to see it. We don't have to experience it because we know it. We can't see it. We can't feel it, but you're working. You're doing things for us, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together, Lord. Just send us forth this week to come, Lord, as your ambassadors. Help us to spread the good news that Jesus Christ has made that way for all who are sinful, all who are destined for hell. Jesus made the way for them. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Go forth this week in power, truth, and might. Serve the great God of the universe, the King of the world. Amen. Thank you.